and uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to talk about ionization methods. So when we think about um, mass spectrometers, we think about all of these components that comprise an instrument. And the ionization source is important because it converts the neutral molecules into, um, into uh, charged species. Once uh, they're charged, they can be steered uh, by electric fields. They can be separated on the basis of mass to charge, and our detectors generally work on the basis of detecting charge. And there are different types of ionization sources depending on uh, the types of molecule and the application that we're interested in pursuing. Um, when we talk about these ionization sources, they can either be internal, as shown in this diagram where um, the sample is introduced and then the ionization is performed, or they can be external, where the ionization is performed uh, outside of the instrument, essentially, and then it is uh, brought into the instrument for separation uh, by mass to charge. So when we think about uh, molecules and atoms and we think about charge, um, of course, uh, an atom can have different charges. Um, so let's think about lead. And we know that lead has several isotopes, just as carbon has carbon-12 and carbon-13. And so if we think about ionizing uh, a lead atom, um, then um, we can think about the simplest ionization process where we just kick off one electron. Right. And so we end up with singly charged lead, and um, that can be in different isotopes. Um, and so, of course, the 208 uh, Dalton lead will show up at 208 m over z for a singly charged ion um, generated by simply kicking off an electron. Right. And so our instruments measure mass to charge. So if the lead is singly charged, then the peak shows up at 208, 207 for the other isotope. Of course, we know that it's also possible to kick off two electrons. And so if we have lead 2 plus, then that species would show up at half of this mass to charge ratio at 104. So um, an important and um, um, long-standing means of ionizing molecules is electron ionization. Um, um, when I was a student, that was called electron impact or electron bombardment, but uh, today's term is uh, electron ionization to harmonize with other ionization methods. Right? And so if we think about, um, let's say, a gas chromatograph, and if we look at the diagram, we can imagine a vapor that is entering a region from this uh, inlet tube, and um, let's say that that region uh, has, a, has a filament that's heated, and the filament will be boiling off electrons. Uh, the electrons will be accelerated towards this anode at, um, uh, at some energy. And so we can imagine that the um, effluent from our gas chromatograph will come into here and will get intersected by these electrons. And the electrons will then knock off electrons from our molecules. Um, eluding from the gas chromatograph. And so this equation simply describes what happens. We have our analyte, M, that is hit by an electron, and it knocks off another electron. And so we end up with our analyte molecules, and they have lost an electron, so they are actually cation radicals. And so we refer to them as M plus dot for the singly charged ones. And so this is a means for generating our ions from, say, small organic molecules. We can vary the electron energy. And so at very low electron energies, we may not see any ions. But as we increase the energy to, say, 7 to 15 electron volts, we begin to generate ions and um, we begin to see those ions fragment. And so this is the classic behavior of electron ionization. Once we exceed a, a certain threshold, there doesn't seem to be a change in the fragmentation pattern. And so we can have a fingerprint for various pure molecules, pure compounds. And generally 50 to 70 electron volts was uh, the energy that was used for electron ionization. 
and so we can look at a small molecule like pentobarbital, which has a mass of 226 Daltons, and see that under electron ionization, we would obtain a spectrum that looks something like this. Right? It would be disappointing because we don't see the 226 peak for the cation radical. It has all fragmented, but we do get these fragments that would um, be a fingerprint of the pentobarbital. So how can we uh, how can we make this uh, gentler? How can we obtain a, a molecular ion, the M plus dot? Well, um, there are two ways to make gentler ionization. One is to reduce the energy of the electron ionization. That will reduce the sensitivity, but it will also reduce the fragmentation. With today's mass analyzers, this is a, a good option for, say, gas chromatography to obtain the M plus dot. Another method to obtain uh, masses in, in a gentler uh, approach is chemical ionization. And so in chemical ionization, the sample is mixed with a lot of some simple molecule that is very easily ionized. So methane is one of those molecules. And so we can imagine that methane could be bombarded with electrons to generate the methane molecular ion, the M plus dot, for methane, and that's a reactive species, so it would generate many other species. Uh, of those species, the CH5 plus and the C2H5 plus are the most important to us for chemical ionization because they are really fine proton donors. And so um, most things will accept a proton from CH5 plus. And so um, we can think about ionizing now by, um, by having our, our analyte actually gain a, pro a proton. So uh, in this case, we're ionizing by adding a proton, and that is a very, uh, very useful approach for generating ions. All right. And so here we see the pentobarbital again, and now we have the large 227 peak. Okay, so an M plus dot would have been 226, but the protonated pentobarbital shows up at 227 because of that proton. And we see that there is still some fragmentation. Right? Other reagent gases um, can also be used for chemical ionization and might reduce the fragmentation somewhat. So these are uh, two workhorse ionization methods for small organics. Um, a variation on chemical ionization that is very popular today, it's uh, very widely used for small drug molecules, is atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. So instead of using methane, we can think about using air, using room air. And so we can look um, inside our instrument and we can imagine that we have, um, let's say, uh, effluent from a liquid chromatograph. HPLC. And so um, our liquid from the HPLC is being delivered through this orifice uh, along with nebulizing gas. So um, along with a, a lot of air, that's going to generate uh, an aerosol that uh, enters the instrument and encounters this electric discharge from this needle. Right. So we strike a corona discharge basically with room air uh, and our analyte is entrained in that. So if you have a discharge in room air, um, oxygen and nitrogen, the main species uh, in positive ion mode are protonated water clusters. And so the protonated water clusters uh, can donate protons to our analytes in APCI. In negative ion mode, the main species are O2 minus with a lot of waters around it. And so if that encounters our analyte, that can generate deprotonated ions, so M minus H minus. And so APCI is um, a very sensitive, um, very robust uh, ionization method. Okay. Um, uh, a, a rarely used ionization method today that was popular perhaps 20 years ago um, is uh, field ionization and also field desorption. These are related techniques and they really illustrate what you can do with a very high voltage. Um, they remain useful for um, analysis of very nonpolar polymers. 
So in the case of field ionization, one would um, take a, a non-volatile uh, polymer, let's say, and attempt to volatilize it and then attempt to ionize it. In the case of field desorption, one would deposit that sample onto this um, hairy wire, if you will, or thorny wire. This is a tungsten wire on which carbon fibers have been deposited. And so you can imagine um, a wire such as this being biased to 10,000 volts. And, and think about um, at the tip of those filaments what the electric field must be like. It can reach 10 to the 8th volts per centimeter, so an extremely high electric field. And so those fibers actually have the ability to quantum mechanically extract an electron from a molecule that uh, that's touching that point. And it's a method that um, usually doesn't produce much vibrational motion, and so usually there's limited fragmentation. And so um, it can be illustrated with uh, glutamic acid, a single amino acid, and we can compare electron ionization, that first method that we talked about that generates cation radicals um, to, uh, to field ionization and desorption. And so with the electron ionization, we see no molecular ion, no M plus dot. The, it, the molecule is all fragmented. With the field ionization, we do see um, an M plus H plus in this case. Um, in, uh, in the case, uh, some molecules can protonate. Some molecules might form the cation radical under field ionization, field desorption conditions. We see that the field des desorption is really gentle where the molecule has actually protonated and we get a nice strong signal. So that is um, essentially a forerunner to some of our ionization techniques today. Um, uh, of course, the big challenge up until uh, around 1989 was how we could really convert a large molecule, a large biomolecule, into a, a, a charged gaseous molecule. Because biomolecules are non-volatile but also very fragile. If we attempt to heat them, to vaporize them, they will decompose. And so um, several different approaches have been employed to generate ions from these species. Um, and so one that I'll talk about is matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization, known as MALDI. That was introduced by Tanaka in Japan and also um, um, Hillenkamp and Karras in Germany. Um, Tanaka received the Nobel Prize for um, his embodiment of, uh, of uh, MALDI or laser desorption. Um, Hillenkamp Karras um, uh, developed the method that we really use today, the really widely employed version. And so the way that MALDI works is that our analyte, generally peptides and proteins or perhaps oligonucleotides, carbohydrates, is co-crystallized on a MALDI target. And so um, it's co-crystallized with a matrix. That matrix is generally a small, highly conjugated organic molecule. The key is that the matrix has to absorb energy uh, efficiently at uh, the, the wavelength of a laser with which we're going to irradiate it. And so the idea in MALDI is that we might have 50,000 matrix molecules to one analyte. And the matrix molecules, when um, irradiated with pulsed laser light, will absorb the laser light and they will be extremely highly excited so that they will actually volatilize. And so uh, the laser shines onto our deposit of sample and matrix and um, that, that matrix deposit essentially erupts. It uh, flings out all of these molecules of matrix. The analyte is, um, goes along for the ride. And we have a plume of electrons, protons, matrix. Um, and um, the plume um, becomes more and more diffuse uh, the farther we are from, uh, the, from the deposit. But basically, it is within this plume that the molecules are likely ionized. The molecules are protonated in positive ion mode, generally deprotonated in negative ion mode for most, uh, for almost all analytes, and definitely proton, uh, definitely proteins and peptides and oligonucleotides. And so we can imagine that in an instrument 
um, our deposit is neutral until the moment where the laser fires and uh, generates all the ions. Once our analyte is ionized, it sees uh, uh, an electric field of perhaps, uh, uh, well, well, we'll have 20,000 volts, say, on, a, on a, the back of the sample stage. And so the ions are accelerated and transferred to our mass spectrometer. These are just further cartoons illustrating that process, illustrating a few matrix molecules dispersed, or sorry, a few analyte molecules dispersed in all of that matrix, and then uh, the plume from the irradiation event, and then sort of the eruption that's, uh, that's simultaneously occurring. All right. So um, MALDI is, uh, is today performed with 337 nanometer nitrogen lasers or 355 nanometer neodymium YAG lasers. Um, that's because they're, um, they're reliable lasers, they're not that expensive, um, and this is a, a convenient wavelength for selecting matrices. Other wavelengths have been used in the past and can be used, but the bulk of the work is done with these, uh, these wavelengths. Generally, um, when we're looking at proteins, um, they will be denatured under these conditions. That's partially because many of the matrices are solubilized in organic containing solutions with a little acid, so protein structure doesn't doesn't survive that in solution. But also um, the, the laser activation at 337 nanometers at least seems to disrupt non-covalent interactions. So um, that's fine. Um, we, uh, we will get uh, masses of uh, subunits from complexes and, um, and we can do that very sensitively. This is an illustration of uh, matrix deposits with analyte. Um, they, the spots look very different because different matrices were employed to generate these spots. And this is a type of uh, target, uh, target sample plate. And so we can imagine having 384 different spots, 384 different samples that will automatically be analyzed for us by MALDI. Um, MALDI is a, a powerhouse technique because it's uh, simple to perform. It can be uh, employed on relatively inexpensive mass spectrometers, and um, the instrument can take a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of dirt, a lot of uh, a lot of various substances, um, and so um, we can work with a range of concentrations um, and uh, and easily obtain spectra. Uh, the most popular MALDI matrices are these three. Um, this one, uh, the shorthand is alpha cyano. It's a, a popular matrix for peptides. It also works for proteins um, and some other molecules. Cinepinic acid, we can see, is related to um, the alpha cyano. It's um, really good for proteins. It works with peptides. It's simply not as sensitive as the alpha cyano. And the dihydroxybenzoic acid, um, the 2,5 isomer is good for both peptides and proteins, sometimes used with carbohydrates. It has a different selectivity, but these are the three matrices that uh, people typically uh, begin using, and they may uh, turn to other ones, particularly if they're looking at nonpolar polymers. This is an example of a MALDI mass spectrum of um, looks like milk, and um, we can see several proteins. Uh, the spectra are relatively simple uh, because the charging is typically not that high. Um, we can see, uh, we typically obtain singly charged ions for peptides, sometimes doubly charged ions for proteins at, let's say, 80. Thousand Daltons, we may see singly charged, doubly charged, and perhaps triply charged with cinepinic acid matrix. There are a few other matrices that will yield more charge, but uh, the most popular ones will only give us one or two, maybe three. And so that means that in a mixture analysis, um, there, there generally aren't that many peaks. And so if we look at um, some of our milk proteins and we look at our caseins here, we can see the singly charged molecules at 24,000 Daltons. We can see the doubly charged ones here at about 12,000 Daltons. Um, and um, 
And so how do I know that they're singly and doubly charged? Well, I can work it out mentally because um, if uh, this must be, if this if this peak shows up at about half the mass of that, then it's probably related. Sorry, if this peak is shows up at half of this mass is probably related. We'll talk more about that with electrospray. Okay, so um, we can see this person having a large sneeze and uh, they're generating an aerosol and that aerosol might actually contain proteins. And um, electrospray is uh, also a method that generates aerosols. And so um, we can look here. Um, now Calvin has been electrified and he too is releasing an aerosol. And we can imagine that we generate this aerosol at atmospheric pressure and um, these droplets um, are actually brought into our mass spectrometer for analysis. That is electrospray ionization. Um, that process of generating these um, electrified uh, aerosols um, is capable of ionizing a wide range of molecules, uh, peptides, proteins, oligonucleotides, basically molecules that have some polarity um, can uh, likely be ionized by electrospray ionization. Uh, a hallmark of electrospray ionization is its ability to place a lot of charge on molecules. And typically, the larger the molecule, the more charge um, can be placed on it. The molecular weight range is far in excess of 150 kilodaltons. In fact, today people are analyzing um, viruses, so megadalton sizes are, uh, are amenable to electrospray. Electrospray uh, it introduces analyte as a liquid. That can be a very good thing because it interfaces with many liquid separation methods. And so it is a really uh, a powerhouse method for liquid chromatography. And so here we have an electrospray spectrum uh, of, um, I think, myoglobin. Um, and uh, we can see the charges. Um, and so if it's myoglobin, it's about 17,000 Daltons. And within that 17,000 Daltons, um, we can load up to, say, 24 charges. The charging is by protonation because this is um, an atmospheric pressure kind of uh, ionization method. And, um, and so you can see the breadth also. Every one of these peaks um, differs from the peak adjacent to it by one proton. And that is a useful feature. All right, so to talk a little about uh, the history of this method. Um, electrospray generation of ions of polymers began with Malcolm Dole around 1968. Malcolm Dole was interested in um, polystyrene polymers and um, so he gave uh, electrospray ionization a try. He detected the ions by ion mobility. He was concerned about the ability to detect very, very large ions. Um, and so he selected that method. Um, and so unfortunately, um, he saw ions, he detected them, but he never realized that they might actually be multiply charged. Um, and so John Fenn was the individual who recognized that the ions produced by electrospray were multiply charged, highly charged. And so um, John Fenn uh, adopted electrospray to operate on a mass spectrometer. And um, these are some of his original spectra presented in 1988. And so we can see for insulin, the four, five, and six charges. We can see for cytochrome C, um, the number of charges. And that's just a very striking distribution. When you think about a pure compound giving rise to all of these peaks, that was quite a shock in 1988. A main benefit of having all of those uh, all of those charges is that John Fenn had a mass spectrometer that um, couldn't really go that high in mass to charge ratio and yet he could detect 12 kilodalton um, 16 kilodalton proteins and so that is another uh, feature of electrospray ionization. And so to talk more about how these ions are generated, um, we can look at an aerosol, a plume from electrospray ionization shown here, uh, and also a cartoon shown here. So you can imagine our analyte in uh, some type of solvent that's flowing through this needle. 
and the needle is uh, electrified, right? So we have our, our, our voltage bias on our needle relative to the inlet to our mass spectrometer. And so you can imagine that that liquid, if it has any connectivity, will uh, become polarized. And in the electric field, that liquid at the tip of the needle will be extruded in the electric field, right? It's being pulled out because of the charge that is on the surface of that uh, of that liquid, and the liquid is still held together as it's extruded by its surface tension. And so we can imagine in this filament region that there is just a lot of charge on the surface of that, that liquid filament. Right? So we refer to this region uh, of the electrospray as the Taylor cone, this sort of cone-shaped area. And uh, physicists and engineers can tell us a great deal about uh, the shape of this Taylor cone and the angles and so forth based upon the properties of the, the liquid and the uh, electric fields, right? We in mass spectrometry care about how that fine filament of liquid becomes unstable and basically um, decomposes and gives rise to the mist or to the, to the plume of droplets, right? And so um, what happens is that at some point, the uh, Coulomb repulsion, the repulsion from all of the charges that are on the surface of the liquid or that act as though they're on the surface of the liquid, that Coulomb repulsive force overcomes the surface tension uh, that holds the liquid together. And so that causes the decomposition into these droplets. And so uh, from there, we start out with larger droplets that have uh, a lot of charge, um, but uh, we're using volatile solvents in electrospray, so the solvent is actually evaporating, making the charge density um, on the surface of the liquid, uh, the charge per square centimeter, increase. And it increases with increasing evaporation, and eventually it overcomes the surface tension of the droplet, and the droplet decomposes to uh, basically uh, undergo cool, a Coulomb explosion or a Coulomb fission, and that releases smaller droplets that are charged that evaporate, uh, decompose again, release tinier droplets, and so forth. And so eventually, um, we have um, we have ions, either bare ions or wet ions, um, that are sucked into the instrument where they encounter a, a gas flow that attempts to remove the last of the solvent, and um, and then they enter the mass spectrometer for mass analysis. Hey, so, Rachel, could I uh, yeah. ask a question that just came up? I think it's timely and where you're at right now, if that's okay. Oh, great. So the question is. Um, is the Rayleigh limit related to setting of the declustering potential? Uh, it is not. The Rayleigh limit is um, the Rayleigh limit applies to the droplet applies to the droplet in uh, well just the isolated droplet, um, and so the Rayleigh limit is determined uh, by the radius of the droplet and the surface tension of the liquid. Um, those are the, the two things that uh, that describe the Rayleigh limit. And people have taken a lot of pictures of uh, decomposing decomposing droplets, and they have uh, confirmed that droplets that that relationship of uh, when the droplet actually decomposes is pretty consistent. It uh, droplets decompose within 60 to 110 percent of the Rayleigh limit. So great cost. Great great question. Thanks. Thank you. So you may hear about nano spray or nano electrospray. That is um, really basic electrospray, um, but it's a name that applies to for to performing electrospray on uh, tinier needles. All right. So originally, electrospray was performed at uh, a, a minimum of one microliter a minute, three microliters per minute, ten microliters per minute. Um, it was very, very stable, very, very robust um, under, at those flow rates, but people realized, um, Matthias Wilm actually realized, that you could go to very, very tiny needles and um, consume much less material, which is very desirable in many cases. And so um, you could generate really low flow rates and still uh, obtain an electrospray. 
right? And um, one of the great things about these very low flow rates uh, about nanospray is that the efficiency of ionization improves as the flow rate is lowered. That um, may seem surprising, but if uh, you think about uh, the electrospray process and you think about how much charge you can place on droplets, the charge is really limited by uh, the electrospray current, by how much current you uh, you can generate, um, uh, you know, in this in this direction, and so um, the. Uh, if you have a, a fixed amount of electrospray current and you have a large flow of liquid, then uh, the charge per droplet is lower than if you have uh, a low flow. And so that's one of the reasons that the efficiency um, isn't affected that much by going to lower and lower flow rates. So it means that um, we might as well consume less sample to obtain nearly the same signal. Here are some uh, il illustrations of mass spectra of uh, denatured proteins from electrospray. A very favorite uh, solution composition for electrospray is of, of proteins is a 50% water, 50% acetonitrile um, with some acid, acetic acid or formic acid. Um, these are all volatile. Volatility is, um, is important and useful for electrospray mass spectrometry. One can employ a, a higher organic content, uh, one can use a lower organic content, one can use methanol, uh, um, but uh, these are uh, good solution compositions. Um, what's in, what, what we look for is, uh, is for the solution composition to be volatile and for analyte to be soluble in uh, in the solution composition. So characteristics of electrospray ionization for proteins are these sort of bell-shaped uh, charge state distributions. We see that many charges are, uh, are placed onto these molecules. As I said, uh, adjacent peaks are separated by a single charge, and the larger the molecule, the more charge, and often the broader the distribution under denaturing conditions. We can also perform electrospray under non-denaturing conditions. So let's say we're spraying um, some proteins from water, uh, or we might have a volatile buffer, let's say 10 millimolar ammonium acetate, 100 millimolar ammonium acetate. It's volatile, so we can, we can use it. Um, and so under conditions where the protein or protein complex, uh, protein DNA complex, um, if this, it, under conditions where in solution um, that complex is associated, we can often um, retain the association of those subunits in the gas phase. And so that has been a, a remarkable capability of electrospray. And so we illustrate um, two complexes here obtained under these non-denaturing conditions. They're non-denaturing in solution. In the gas phase, um, one can argue about how well the, uh, the structure uh, of the, the gas phase complex is preserved. Clearly, some elements are preserved because it holds together. Um, and so you can see that for the 700,000 Dalton 28 subunit complex that um, we can place 51 charges on it. Um, Gros a 791,000 Dalton complex um, uh, is clearly better resolved here. Um, and um, we can see all those charges. An important point is that we look at the M over Z, the mass to charge, and this is very high. Um, and that's uh, one of the issues with um, with performing mass spectrometry under these non-denaturing conditions. The, uh, the ionization of the folded proteins tends to produce um, much lower charge versus the denatured um, equivalently sized species. Um, and so we need special mass analyzers that have uh, mass to charge ranges that can um, that can uh, detect something at these really high M over Z's. But this Rachel, is an important. Rachel, could I interrupt you again with a timely question that just came in? Yes. Uh, yeah. So this one is from Mark Martin, and he asks, "How does one assess the charge from these data? Like, how many charges? Fifty or seventy? Yeah. How do you know that?" Right. So the way that you know that. Is um, is that if we have 68 charges on um, this particular peak, uh, 
and we know the mass to charge. Um, if we also have, uh, we also have this peak and we know its mass to charge, we know that this peak has one less charge, so it has 67. And so from algebra, we have two unknowns, right? Our mass is unknown and our charge is unknown. Um, uh, at least, um, OK, I know them because I labeled the peak. But if I didn't know that, all I would know is that these two differ by one charge state. Uh, but I would also know their m over z's. And so that is two pieces of information that the that these differ by one charge and I know their m over z's. So I know their mass. So let's say I know the difference in m over z's. I know the difference in charge and that's two equations and two unknowns. And so with simple algebra, I can solve for the mass. Uh, the same thing can be done for the next two peaks, the next two peaks and the next two peaks and so forth. And so that's how we obtain the, the mass. Um, with high resolution mass analyzers, there are other tricks. Um, we may be able to resolve isotopes, and if the isotopes, let's say, are spaced by a half a Dalton, right, the carbon 13 versus the carbon 12, if those are spaced by half a Dalton, then I know that something is doubly charged. So those are the, the two ways that we can uh, that we can calculate masses. OK, um, I would like to talk about uh, a variant of electrospray. There are many variants and they all have different names. Many of what appear to be the same variants have different names. Um, this is also true of MALDI. There are many variants of MALDI. Um, so I'll just pick one variant, uh, desorption electrospray ionization or DESI. Um, this was introduced in 2004, and DESI um, is uh, is performed by taking an electrospray. So here we have our uh, here we have our our needle that's um, putting out our aerosol, and the aerosol is impinging on a surface. That surface might have sample deposited on it, or it might actually be. Um, Oh, it might be a fingerprint or something, and we want to see if someone had explosive on their hands. Uh, in any case, that aerosol impinges on uh, the surface, and um, the aerosol interacts with the surface and um, and releases ions. Okay, they are probably uh, they are probably wet ions, uh, very wet ions and droplets, but they um, they um, find their way to the mass spectrometer and then they can be analyzed. So uh, this is a, a popular approach. People like, um, you know, people like having a tube that they can move around and, and sample all kinds of surfaces. And uh, that's illustrated here where um, we can see, I think, a uh, desi of fruit. And so you can imagine um, a little needle uh, that uh, is putting out uh, a liquid here and then um, and then that the drops go into the tube here to find their way to a mass spectrometer. DESI is, um, is a good method for small molecules. It, um, it can be challenged somewhat by larger molecules, uh, but it, uh, people uh, are interested in it for real-time analyses. So I want to talk a bit about how ions are formed in uh, electrospray. Um, this has uh, this has been a been a debate for 30 years and it, it continues. Um, but uh, we know a few things. We know that we generate these droplets um, and then the droplets decompose because of the Rayleigh limit. And um, the droplets are decomposing because solvent is evaporating, increasing the charge density until uh, the repulsion overcomes the surface tension. And so um, that droplet disintegration um, where a large droplet releases many small droplets uh, is described by was described by Lord Rayleigh by the Rayleigh limit equation. And um, as we talked about earlier, that just tells us that the charge um, on a, a droplet, the maximum charge that a droplet can hold is related to its radius and its surface tension gamma. Okay. So that tells us how the droplets behave, but it doesn't tell us um, uh, it doesn't tell us where the ions come from, you know, the, um, and so there are there are two two very simple uh, uh, theories. Um, uh, the first introduced by Malcolm Dole in 1968 was the charged residue model. And so we can think about a droplet that has a protein um, embedded in it. 
And we can think about that droplet evaporating. Um, just as it does until it becomes a smaller and a smaller and a smaller droplet. And so we can think about uh, at the very bitter end, the last water molecules evaporate away uh, and leave, uh, leave our analyte ions, our charged residue uh, as it is. Okay, so that's one model. The other model is uh, exactly the opposite approach. Uh, and that was uh, proposed by Thompson and Urbarn in 1979. In that approach, um, once we get to a very, very small droplet, uh, the ions, the analyte ions evaporate. So the analyte ions just leave the droplet behind. So either water leaves, uh, water leaves the analyte or solvent leaves the analyte or analyte leaves the solvent. Those were the main two models. And um, we debated and debated. In 2001, Fernandez de la Mora um, uh, came up with a twist on the charged residue model. And so he said that um, let's consider a charged residue and let's think about, or sorry, yes, let's consider a, a droplet that has a protein in it. Uh, right. If it's a large droplet, solvent will evaporate. It will undergo Coulomb decompositions, uh, Rayleigh fissions, and be a smaller droplet. And the process will repeat until we have um, the smallest droplet we can imagine. A droplet that's about the size of the protein or about the size of the analyte. And so then uh, uh, Fernandez de la Mora said, well, let's consider this. We know that that protein um, it can't carry more charge than a droplet, the droplet that holds it. Right? So the protein, the maximum charge on the protein is a charge on the droplet that holds it. And so he said, well, that droplet has to be just larger or about the size of that analyte. And so he said, let's consider, let's consider a droplet, uh, let's say it's water, and let's consider a droplet that is the same size as our analyte, as our protein. And let's consider um, the maximum charge um, uh, defined by Rayleigh that a droplet of that size could hold. And then let's um, just assume that that is the maximum charge that our protein can carry, right? If it is being created by the charge residue model. And so um, with that kind of approach, one is basically relying on the surface tension of the solvent to define what the maximum charge on an analyte of a given size would be. And so um, Delamora uh, did those calculations and um, he came up with maximum charges and people have compared these to what they observe in electrospray. And when electrospray is performed under non-denaturing conditions, most of the time um, it's pretty, pretty consistent. You know, although people um, people will plot average charge instead of maximum charge, and the plots are on, on the log scale because people have to cover a large molecular weight range, it does seem to be kind of consistent. So um, this paper is very important. It's persuaded um, it's persuaded most people that the ions are uh, ions are released um, when electrosprayed under non-denaturing conditions. Uh, that they're um, released by the charge residue model. Um, of course, when proteins are released uh, from solutions that are denaturing, um, the charge was much, much, much too high. So conveniently, um, the, the argument uh, or the, the conclusion was that um, uh, non-denaturing conditions, charged residue model creates ions. Denaturing conditions, uh, ion evaporation model uh, created the ions, right? Um, and so not everyone was, uh, was persuaded, um, I think primarily because some people don't like to uh, assume that they assume that the surface tension will be uh, unaffected by the presence of a protein in a droplet. And so some people don't want to make this assumption. In any case, um, the community uh, was uh, uh, the community was all for that. Um, for many years, but then Lars Connerman um, began performing many, many uh, molecular dynamics simulations on droplets that carried a, pro a protein. And so um, there was already a considerable discomfort with the ion evaporation model for proteins because many people did not believe that large molecules could evaporate from, say, a, a spherical droplet. Uh, 
Um, so Lars Connerman's laboratory came up with this uh, chain ejection model where um, he argues that if we have a denatured species uh, or a species that doesn't really assume uh, a consistent structure, so uh, a polymer, uh, polyethylene uh, or uh, polyethylene glycol, um, let's just assume uh, or let's think about what it might do. And so he considered that the analyte might actually um, begin to uh, stretch out and equilibrate with charge in the droplet to emerge in this manner. Okay. In, uh, in the early days, we might have called that ion evaporation too, but, um, but Lars carefully made a dis distinction. Um, the ion evaporation model is still used today for, uh, for like sodium, sodium chloride clusters for small molecules. Um, but uh, Lars's model has been um, extremely popular. Um, and so today, uh, if you read the literature, I think that um, uh, most people most people believe that these three mechanisms are going on in electrospray and are important. So people believe that molecules under five kilodaltons, some people say one kilodalton, um, uh, those ions are released by ion evaporation, just uh, going away from the droplet. Um, and so um, in ion evaporation, there is um, say no, uh, no relationship between charge um, uh, and that mechanism. Some people, or many people believe that the folded proteins, compact species, um, uh, are uh, released uh, from the droplet by that charge residue model. And so they believe that those species, that their charges, the maximum charge, should be less than what would de be defined by the Rayleigh limit. Right. And then the denatured proteins, so molecules greater than five kilodaltons that are unfolded, floppy, um, the argument is that, that they emerge by this uh, chain ejection model. Right. So that, uh, that is what most people believe today. Um, there are a few outliers. Um, so some people, uh, these, uh, this is an image of a decomposing droplet. Uh, that was produced by Gomez and Tang in 1994. And so some people uh, believe that once the droplet distorts to release the, uh, the, the small droplets, right? This is a Rayleigh fission event. Uh, some people believe that the ions might be emerging from these filaments and that they might be released here as well as droplets. Um, that wasn't a very popular point of view, um, uh, but perhaps it will change because uh, Lars Connerman uh, performed more simulations and just last year um, uh, found a, a really interesting result. And so um, up until recently, um, the limitations on computation power um, kept uh, Lars modeling droplets to uh, three nanometers in size. All right, but recently he was able to model larger droplets, uh, about 5.5 nanometers, and um, he found that the 5.5 nanometer droplets began to show um, uh, this type of behavior, all right, which uh, looks to be an ion evaporation. The uh, folded ubiquitin um, in solution um, in, a, in a droplet uh, still uh, emerges from the droplet sort of globular, and so that is... Um, uh, it will be interesting to see uh, to see how the field uh, how the field progresses, but uh, but if this is all all a debate. Um, I, I talk about these uh, I talk about these three methods because this is most of what you will read, and if um, you are sort of describing uh, your results in terms of ion production today the the safest bet the safest bet is to think about uh, is to think about these three approaches all right and um, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions thank you Rachel that was terrific so I do have a couple questions that I was unable to help out with so I'm glad you've got some time. <laughs> All right, so the first question is um, uh, a student that says um, uh, they would like to, uh, they basically purify plasma lipoproteins using FPLC size exclusion. And the question is, could you use native MS to look at the lipoprotein with its, uh, but any potential interactors you think? Huh. So, um... Oh, let's see. These are uh, uh, 
so if these are small complexes, they uh, they should be amenable by electrospray. The hope would be oh, the challenge is that um, the challenge is that uh, if a lot of complexes uh, are heterogeneous, it may be hard to uh, obtain uh, interpretable spectra. Of course, uh, the plasma has to not have. Um, has, has to not have a lot of salt in it. I guess it won't. It, it, that should be okay. But with a very complex mixture, it may not be possible to interpret. Um, the lipids, uh, it would be nice. Okay, it would be good if, uh, if uh, free lipids are not present in the sample. But, uh, but so some work with uh, simple complexes is possible. If, uh, let's say one was talking about HDL particles. Um, with uh, something like HDL or LDL particles, the electrospray itself is capable of spraying those and generating particles. Um, typically, uh, our mass spectrometers are not where those would be would not would be analyzed. Um, something like HDL particles could be analyzed on uh, uh, an instrument called a GEMMA, uh, a gas phase electrophoretic mobility. Uh, analyzer. And so that's really just an ion mobility instrument, but it will see very large, uh, very large particles. And so they could be measured that way. Um, the the gamma is a, is a bit, uh, it's a, it, it has a few other twists since it's not directly measuring mass to charge. It's measuring mobility. Uh, it has to take into consideration things like the density of the particle. But that, but in principle, what's limiting um, electrospray ionization of really, really large heterogeneous things is the, um, is, uh, is the mass analyzer. And, uh, and uh, the charge may make things confusing. I didn't mention that. So the attraction of the gamma, uh, the the gas phase electrophoretic mass analyzer is that it reduces uh, it reduces the charge. So you generate the highly charged particles, and then it charge reduces so that the spectra will be simple simplified. Um, and so uh, Lloyd Smith, uh, <laughs> Lloyd Smith at Wisconsin, could tell you a great deal about the about the gamma. Uh, he's published papers on that. Very good. Okay, thank you. We've got a couple more here. Um, so here's another one. For the analysis of small organic compounds using electrospray, what correlation is between ionization, nebulizer pressure, and drying gas? Oh, for small molecules. Um, so, so the most important point is that your small molecule has to have some polarity, right? Well, ideally, if it's soluble, if it's soluble in uh, water or uh, acetonitrile, it has sufficient polarity, I think. Um, so let's see, it was uh, nebulizing gas pressure. Um, yeah, I think it was more about like what um, parameters are like, I said my sense was our most important. Um, okay, so with, for small, small molecules are not, uh, are not particularly challenging by electrospray. Um, um, and so, um, and they tend to, uh, they tend to be fairly rugged. So um, the nebulizing gas, um, one adjusts that for, one adjusts that for signal um, and stability, let's say, of the spray. Um, the, anything to desolvate, um, one looks for good desolvation. Um, you don't want water sticking to it, but that isn't uh, that isn't that difficult. Um, and so, um, if one has a little bit of signal um, on a small molecule, we adjust uh, we adjust the nebulizing gas. We adjust any uh, desolvation gas going in the opposite direction uh, for signal. And um, in instruments, there's a, there's generally a temperature control. Uh, for example, if it's a capillary inlet, uh, one can control the temperature of that capillary. Um, small molecules, um, small molecules take to those temperatures really well. And so, um, uh, typically, one uh, one one just adjusts everything for maximum signal. Um, if it's an unknown sample that we're having difficulty with, I would um, I would look for I would ask someone, you know, what works every time and what are their conditions with a small molecule and set up for that and then see if I got any signal um, for my analyte. 
Excellent. OK, we've got two more here. I think we should be able to get them in our time slot. Uh, with with supercharging agents, this is the second question I've got about supercharging. Supercharging um, with supercharging agents used to increase charge states, would the CRM model still hold? <laughs> well, uh, OK, so a supercharging agent is a non volatile uh, additive. Um, that one um, that one adds to their solution. It's not present in really high amounts, um, but it's it's involatile, and um, and many people have observed that um, their charge of say proteins increases with the supercharging agent, and so um, that is a big argument. Um, uh, the supercharging agents, um, there are there are concentrations and agents that don't appear to denature proteins. Um, and so um, uh, one. How, how should I put this? Wait, so the people who believe that the charge residue model um, produces the ions have to reconcile the supercharging with that. Um, so people argue about this. Um, I would say that uh, it was actually the supercharging agents that led me to become interested in ionization again, because many of the observations with supercharging agents cannot be explained by the charge residue model. Um, the ion evaporation model uh, or a, a variation on that will explain how the uh, how the supercharging agents work. Um, uh, the people uh, people who uh, strongly believed in the CRM argued that the supercharging agents altered the surface tension. Being non-volatile, they tend to accumulate, and um, and that would alter the surface tension of the droplet. And so um, the 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 most popular counter argument is that you alter the surface tension, you alter the charging. Um, but uh, there are a lot of reasons why. Uh, why some of us believe that that's not the case. Um, one is that, um, oh, uh, geez, uh, why am I not thinking of his name? Uh, in Australia, there is a young scientist, um, uh, a young professor, um, and he, well, he's published some of the most exciting supercharging work. Um, and uh, and uh, he has a nice plot in one of his papers where he shows the correlation between supercharging, uh, uh, between supercharging and surface tension. And in, in his plot, there looks to be no correlation whatsoever. And so that uh, that could be an argument against the charge residue model. So, uh, but this is, this continues to be discussed. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, well, hopefully we have time for one more. We got a couple minutes here. Uh, so here it is. The last question: uh, What would be the approach to determine the nature of complexes? For example, an protein that can form a large fourplex or a decamer, mostly held together by disulfide bridges, and and would those how to maintain those in electrospray, or could they be maintained in electrospray? Ah, so uh, electrospray can uh, can generally maintain non covalent uh, non covalent interactions, even uh, you know even non disulfide bonds. Um, Vicky Waisaki will tell you uh, will, will be the real expert on that later in the program. Um, but uh, the discussion was disulfide bonds. Uh, I, I'm assuming uh, inter inter subunit disulfide bonds. So the disulfide bonds stay intact um, and in proteins uh, disulfide bonds are really, really hard to uh, to break up. Um, and so um, if you have, say, a, a viral capsid that's uh, that's uh, where the subunits are held together by disulfides, that should be super stable by electrospray. Um, I should mention that um, it's a it's a specialization to look at the non-covalent complexes, and so um, Vicky Wasaki will probably tell you more about uh, about the conditions that she employs to try to maintain them. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, um, Rachel, and I want to thank uh, uh, Scott as well for the first lecture of the day, and then all of the. Folks in my group who did the demos uh, was great. So we're going to take an hour break and then come back after lunch in one hour. And um, and I will do my best to keep the standards as high as they've been set with tandem mass spectrometry. <laughs>